we know that movements matter. They are one of the only ways to change gendered social norms, to ensure accountability of power structures, and to influence policy and practice. So what does it mean to organize in today's world in order to assure that gains in women's rights and freedoms are maintained and further opened, and that civic spaces are protected? How do we organize locally on things that matter to us? But how do we also connect and intersect with other movements at the global level? What reunites our fronts? Join the CODI's Global Change Leaders Class of 2018 as they explore these questions and our possibilities of our own organizing as an alumni network. Our presenter today is Eileen Alma, the Director of Women's Leadership and Indigenous Programming of the CODI International Institute. Eileen has more than 25 years of interdisciplinary experience in program development and management and international development research and practice. Eileen's focus is on women's leadership and empowerment, political, economic, social, and legal, which is considered key to addressing poverty and inequities, both locally and globally. She does so by overseeing Cody Institute programs which prioritize education of women and men to become more aware of gendered power dynamics and to be more sensitive, effective leaders in their communities. Eileen also broadly contributes to Cody's wide range of educational programs and community development research. So just a quick note to our listening audience, the sound quality does improve as we go through the webinar. As well, we'd like to acknowledge some additional resources that were used as part of the presentation. Changing Their World, Concepts and Practices of Women's Movements, Second Edition, and also from Just Associates, the Feminist Movement Building. We invite our Cody graduates to continue the conversation in Cody Connects. You will find a link to our webinar series and the discussion forums once you log in to the Cody Graduates node. Enjoy the webinar. So when I thought about this webinar, I thought about it, I guess, months ago. Because as the director of the center, and I've been here for about five years now, I've seen that we now are at a tipping point in terms of the partnerships and the relationships we've been building with women around the world. So just as an example, we have, we're in the final days of this program, but we have approximately now 134 graduates, that's including the classes in this room, 134 graduates just from the Global Change Leaders Program. We also have from our Indigenous communities, Indigenous women leaders of the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit across Canada, we have 109 graduates for one program, another 20 from another program, another 20 that have come through the various certificate courses that we offer. That's also another, that means another 149, 150 women graduates just from that group. We've also worked with the Canadian Women's, um, sorry, the Canadian Women's Foundation, and we had a program running with them, and there's another 71 graduates there, just that. And then we also had a partnership, and I've referred to this over, over um, the course of weeks, that we had a partnership in Africa with five different countries. There were another 25 women from that program, and then going on, we have this Community Development Leadership by Women Certificate that's been running for many years. It's been led by Deb Castle and Emily Sikazway. Um, and that, that program has been more than a decade in, 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 in running. I think maybe closer to 15 or 16 years. And imagine an average of around 20 participants every year. So you can see how many women now have had some exposure to leadership education that we know of, that have come and been part of what we do. And then in addition to that, there's the other Cody programs like the diploma program and others, where women are saying, you know, they also have a particular emphasis on the same work that we've been talking about. So I don't have a calculation for you off the top of my head, but that's now ranging in the numbers of maybe, you know, a thousand or more women just in the last eight or nine years that I can think of. Um, and to me, there's something very powerful about that. And when I think about where all of you are located in your respective spaces, I think a lot about what is it that we can do, A, to build that kind of impact, to really change and move the dial on gender equality, but B, 
how can we really support each other? Because sometimes we're alone. For all the number of people that are around us, we're actually quite alone in the work we do. And we take risks. And we have to calculate what's in our best interest at any given time. And we're juggling. And we're trying to do time management. We're trying to take care of our families. And of course, we are dealing with patriarchy and patriarchal structures or colonial structures that are impeding our progress. So what is it with this number that we can do? And that's my preoccupation. And it might be wishful thinking, but I think there is something that can, be, that can happen. So to the next slide. Okay. I'm pausing my thought because I'm going too fast. No, I mean, you're, you're off the mic, so. Okay, so we lost the, lost the mic. That's awesome, no worries. <laughs> and again, <laughs> Donald. So while we're pausing, because we lost the mic. We actually are, you know, we're not in the, not so don't, the So don't talk? Okay. I'll clean up the recording. <laughs> and I never did get to learn any good dance moves with this class, by the way. Oh, 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 all right keep going keep going we're all set okay so next slide wendy so the questions that i have that i want to share with you is what does it mean to organize in today's world in order to assure the gains that are making on women's rights and freedoms are maintained and further open and civic spaces are protected? How do we organize locally on things that matter to us? And we've been talking a lot about this over the course of seven weeks in the Global Change Leaders class, but also how do we connect and intersect with other movements as well? at the global level and what unites us and do we have the capacity ourselves to be a movement of leaders in a gender equitable in gender equitable community-led practice and how can we build that support for one another so i'd like you to think a little bit about that as i go through a couple more slides that just sort of talk about movements so here i'm quoting about lawala's work um, from awit um, in terms of defining a movement. And some of this is repeating what this class also heard yesterday and, uh, and in previous days and, and weeks um, in the Global Change Leaders Program. But I'll just repeat it here again. It's an organized set of constituents that are pursuing a common political agenda of change through collective action. It has a constituency base or its membership mobilized and it's collectivized. Women, members that are in it are either in, in either formal or informal organization. There's some continuity over time. It could be a very spontaneous uprising uh, in, in terms of the movement, or it could be a campaign um, that leads to a movement. So it could be a long, a sort of a long standing and built campaign that then it also triggers some other collective action to move forward. It has a clear political agenda. There's a shared analysis. There's a shared understanding of what, what the conditions are that you're trying to address. It uses a variety of actions and strategies. And it, it tries to also ensure that those actions, well, it decides on whether those actions are going to be confrontational. When we talk about movements, I believe that yesterday also you discussed a little bit about what a feminist movement would be. Um, and so again, I'm just going to repeat for you that a feminist movement means that there's women that are forming the critical mass of it. That's one, that's one sort of, that's one, um, one of the categories of creating a feminist movement. Another is that there's a, there's a gender analysis of the problem and the issue. And we've spent a lot of time talking about how we can undertake 
good gender-based analysis. But a feminist movement also intentionally builds women's leadership in the movement itself. So it's also about prioritizing you know, women leaders. But think again back to the leadership models from the very beginning of the program or the programs that you took here at CODI and think about what kinds of models you think fit well with sort of leading and generating and pushing movements forward. Um, and part of that has to do with what we think is around power and the power to work with people and the power and power sharing that we do as part of that, which in and itself is a change. It is a shift. It's saying there's a different way of working that we think is really important. And sometimes what happens is a feminist movement also then leads to new organizations being created that are also feminist in terms of their principles. And I think that's really important as well because what the, the actions or the political space of a movement can then help generate new ways of working and doing things and moving those and moving actions forward collectively. So, so let me ask a question of you right now. Why do you think movements matter? Why do you think that movements matter? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah? Because they stimulate people, stimulate changes. They aware people about what's going on and also to decide upon the next step that the, how they will go for that change that they are visioning. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that our, the like reflect of what is happening in the society if a movement starts, it's because something is going wrong <laughs> in some part. And, uh, yeah. So it's to address something that's happening that's just not acceptable, or not acceptable to a collective group of people. Yeah? And uh, movements lead you to be hired better. As one person, it might be a little bit dif difficult to, uh, that everybody will hear your voice. But with the movement, with many voices, it's stronger. Right, exactly. Ada? To me, movements influence the change of policies and uh, they, they, they get everyone engaged, even the marginalized. Even the marginalized. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes? In addition to what I think they they strengthen numbers. So if you organize yourself and come out together, you become united. Okay, so strength in numbers is critical here, right? And that's also important for us as women because it's difficult when we are also feeling like we don't have enough power of our own or we're in a situation where there's a lot of power over um, and things that are controlled by others. This gives us an opportunity to build um, to build and, and to connect with one another and you know also connect our what we see is our power our power within but our power also too but it also gives us sometimes some senses of security as well it's a lot easier to go in mobilized as a number of people than it is to go in on your own and to try to create change so just as you've said, it talks, it's important for collective action. It's important for ensuring accountability of power structures. It helps to reshape the narratives. So let me give you an example. Right now, what we're seeing in some parts of the world, or in, in particular in the US, is dominant narratives that are also wrapped in what some people call fake news, right? <coughs> and all you have to do is repeat the same thing over and over again and people start to believe it right the terminology of draining the swamp you know or crooked hillary are good examples from u.s politics that talk about a particular narrative that actually had a very big impact on what happened so movements also give us an opportunity to shape that narrative as, as well if there's a collective voice coming with a very you know, singular message that counters, it can help to alleviate some of the 
some of the damage that might be caused by you know, what we think are bad narratives, but it also helps us as women get our stories out, right? And I think that's also incredibly important because we need to be able to show what's actually happening and it, it, we can do that together. It influences p policy and practice. And as I said earlier, it, and as um, Bessem also said, it creates a space for women to come together to reinforce individual and collective agency. It also helps us, and this is important for all of us in this room, because you're going back to your respective work, and part of that work is you know, a whole range of projects. It helps us get beyond the projects, right, and into a bigger purpose, and focusing on a bigger purpose. As Nancy Lee would say, it helps us also mobilize policymakers by having heat from the bottom, Right? It's, it's making things hot enough that it's going to create change and cook something in the middle. And it also helps policymakers, especially women leaders in politics, it helps to bolster their own agendas as well. So that's the heat from the top. So Nancy would say, it's like cooking a rice cake. You've got heat from the bottom and heat from the top in order to make it, to make it really change. So where are you located? Where are you located in your organizations? Um, I just want to get a show of hands, and it won't so, you won't see that on the recording, but a show of hands of how many of you feel like you're right in the movement? Two, two three, four, five, six, yeah. seven. So you're in a movement. You're part of a movement. You're active, actively engaged. Give me some examples of the movements you're involved in. Or movement, yes. Well, in society, I'm uh, implementing inclusive education. <coughs> now we are integrating uh, students with special needs from special schools to public schools. It's also a movement. Okay. Yeah, in my part of the uh, work that I'm doing is is increasing the number of women and encouraging them, not only women to be part of the decision making structures and encouraging them but also asking the people sitting on the other side of the table to think differently, that why women are not there, because they never thought of about it, that why women are not there. So mm -hmm. this is on both sides, not only the policy makers, but right. those who I want to be there. Okay, mm -hmm. other examples, yes? Um, I'm part of uh, indigenous movement, who is like fighting organic side, uh, fighting against uh, land grabbing and for the defense of the land and the territory and the rights of the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In Fiji, I am in this movement to increase the minimum wage for mm -hmm. all workers. Okay. Good. Uh, in Kenya, I am in the movement of amplifying the voices of children so that their issues can be considered in the government and policies. Okay. Children's rights. In Bangladesh, I am uh, uh, in a movement in preventing gender based violence and social justice. Okay. Adam? Okay. In, in Cameroon, I'm in the movement to increase the education of young girls in the domain of health and sexual reproductive rights. In Indonesia, I'm um, involving in the uh, movement in the uh, to, uh, to women with uh, HIV AIDS to raise the empathy to them and decrease the stigma among them and also be uh, more acceptable for the community. Okay. All of those are really interesting examples and in some cases there are movements that have flashpoints like you've come together and you said no we can't take this we got to address this issue right now right others of you talked about sort of a larger sort of long-standing movement or collective action that you've been contributing to for a long and sustained time and even women's movement themselves women's movements themselves and i say movements plurally are have been sustained for long periods of time but they don't stay the same they change over time as well right and what i think is interesting about the examples is You've, you're part of that movement, but you may also be working in organizations that are also focused on activities that the movement is suggesting is necessary for that collective action to happen. Am I right? Yeah? So how many of you feel like you're allies of movements or your organizations are allies of movements? Yeah? 
Several. And what would you describe as being an ally of a movement? Yeah. Um, we are developing a project uh, in including women to have access um, to land mm -hmm. for agriculture. So we can be allied in a, a land grabbing fight, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of actions do you take in the project? Is it research? Is it something on the ground that's supporting women and to move forward? Or what is it? Is service delivery mechanisms? What are you doing? Yeah, um, we are trying to, to, to assess first all the lands that are available around them. Mm -hmm. And then to try to give them the land in um, making them adopting the um, agroecological uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. And when they adopt this, and then they're integrating the value chain of economical activities, then we can give them the certificate of land in coordination with um, the government, the local government. Okay, so you're actually, you've already addressed that there's a land rights movement for women anyways, ensuring women's rights and access to land, but you're also doing very specific activities that are making that, that actually physically happen for yeah. them. Yeah? yeah? Did you want to share one as well? In Nigeria, we are allies trying to bring women out of poverty. And so we do a lot of research and come up with improved technologies for women who are growing fruits and vegetables, such that the, we come up with technologies that are affordable, mm -hmm. that are accessible to the women, and are eco-friendly. OK. Um, in my organization, we actually uh, try our best to bring different uh, actors together in order to fight domestic violence. And for that, we create multidisciplinary approach in rural areas, which are responsible for the law on domestic violence so that we can together fight domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And we also have um, different campaigns throughout the, throughout the country using different uh, methods. This we have on 8th of March, plus on 16 days, uh, uh, 16 days activism against gender-based violence. Okay, great. Those are all great examples, again, of how you're allies of movements, but in some cases you're also service-oriented organizations that are contributing to the change that movement, that the movement is actually seeking. So that's also really important. And then there's others of you that are part, that are funders, perhaps, of movements, right? Um, and when I think about some of the work here in Canada of different organizations, Match International Canada is one of those organizations that is really um, driving, they're first of all part of a movement that is trying to support, that is trying to you know, increase support for women-led organizations, but they're also funding organizations as well. So they're both part of the movement, but they're also funders to the movement and also trying to generate other funds for the movement. So those, that's just one example. And you know, others are doing the same, like Global Fund for Women and, and, and so on. Right over here, okay. So I'm just gonna give you some ideas about what we have to be cautious about. Um, first of all, when we talk about where your organizations are in relationship to a movement, and this is important right now, actually, because we do see a real shifting of the tide, whether it's the hashtag Me Too and all of the other movements that have spun from that, or it's movements like Black Lives Matter, or it's movements like Idle No More that's here in Canada, or other movements that, um, that are also supporting women's rights around the world. Sometimes, especially when there's a, there's a momentum, we have a tendency to start placing organizations in a hierarchy on whether they're supportive or not, and who's mm -hmm. the most supportive and who's the least supportive. And it's, I think it's really critical that we don't do that because that's just falling into a trap. So what I mean by that is there will be some organizations and some people that might be really visible mm -hmm. and really vocal and part of the movement, and there's others that are gonna to continue to do the good work that they do whether they're service oriented or otherwise. But we all have contributions to make. And it really um, refers for me back to the way we talk about systems as a whole and the contributions that, uh, of all organizations of people. We also have to be careful that we're not exclusionary. So 
sometimes in our, in our intent of building a movement and, and supporting movements, we tend to also exclude others. Um, that's a, that can be a challenge. We could fail to recognize intersectionality in the movements. Um, and this is, this is important, but it's also a big, you know, it's a big debate really because, you know, what it means is that we have to be very attentive to all the different identities that are, that may be can, in part of the movement or that are intersecting with the movement. So we could have on the one hand, a women, you know, a gender equality agenda and a women's movement pushing forward. We could have on the other hand, an agenda that's supporting, um, you know, the, uh, another minority group. And if we don't pay attention to what those different movements are saying, and how they come together, then we could actually be doing both a disservice. Um, we, we shouldn't also expect that movements will stay forever. That's not the point of them. They evolve and they change. Sometimes they drop away. Sometimes they're long time, but they, but there's, they evolve just as much as anything else. And finally, we have to be careful that, um, we have to be careful of, you know, civic spaces that are closing. And I think many of us recognize that in our particular countries, there have been times when we have not been able to speak out. And it's been very difficult to publicly say that you're part of a movement moving forward. Mm. So those are important things, but here's the one that I want to you to leave, especially since you're going home. I want you to think about, not that we are pushing, again, not that we're pushing a feminist agenda, and not that we're pushing a certain sort of prescribed way of doing work, or that you need to be part of a movement in order to be valid as a woman leader. What I want you to think about is yourself, and when it makes sense for you to come in and out of those spaces, how you protect yourself as well. Sometimes we also overdo it, and that comes back to our initial discussions about self-care. This is a picture of me last year um, wearing my pink pussy hat and my daughter is with me and, um, and we were mobilizing and for my daughter, she's just a young woman and we have one of our colleagues with her daughter here and they don't realize it now but they're kind of getting indoctrinated into, <laughs> into you know, and they'll rally against it but it's, you know, it's important for her to see my action is not just about standing here in front of you in a classroom, but that I actually believe in what, what I'm saying and I'm, and I'm active when I can be. And also to raise awareness for her that even with all the gains we have made, they can go away in a second. And so we do need to keep up the pressure. So there, there we are doing, uh, you, know, you know, sort of being part of something um, last year and we, and we continue to be involved in it. So just moving along. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, hello, is say what challenges do we also see? Let me just say that it sometimes looks like everything just happens overnight. Like when I see some of the gains just in the last two years in North America, as well as the big setbacks that we've had in some political spaces. Like when I think about the gains we've had in Canada, with a feminist government and a feminist uh, agenda in terms of our government priorities and our you know, gender parity and cabinet, those all look really good. And they, but what you know, sometimes we fail to realize is that didn't happen just overnight. That was years and years of pushing from you know, women's movements here in Canada to get to that place. So our wonderful prime minister looks like a, you know, a hero but the real heroes are actually sheroes. They've been the ones that have really propelled us to move forward. So I want to acknowledge that. But I also want to acknowledge that there's also a lot of male champions. So, you know, people like the Prime Minister who I think has his, you know, has his heart in the right place about trying to move forward. And it's important for us to make sure that they are part of the movement as well. Um, you know, it, it can't just be a binary of, you know, of female, male, or women again, and men. It's me to stop talking now, and it's for you to say, you, we've talked about movements, we know what they mean, we've got some good literature that talks about what's been successful. But now I want to know from you, 
what do you think is the potential for us to work together moving forward? Should it be at the local level, which I would expect you would already be engaged, by bringing your alumni groups together or and trying to make those connections and say, let's try to do something a little bit different here. Let's try to think outside of the box of our organizations, our institutions, and let's think about something else. Is it regionally? Because we think there are some particular things that are happening in our respective regions that if we come together, and maybe if you have a little bit of Cody alumni support behind you, we can actually try to shift also and, and, and do something innovative. Is it globally? Where do we want to be located in the global movement, uh, women's movement, which even though you didn't all say it, I see you all in it, right? Mm. So where do you want to be? Where do you want us to be? And you know, how can I and how can our team help you get there? And I'll stop by just adding one more thing, and that is we have opportunities when we see big events that are happening around, uh, you know, at different times of the year. One of those is annually the Commission for the Status of Women in New York. This past year I took, uh, with NIMA, we took an, a, a delegation of Indigenous women from Canada to that space. It's a big gathering. There's usually thousands of people there. There's a whole set of parallel NGO sessions. How many of you have gone to CSW before? How many of you have been to the Commission on Status of Women? Okay. That's telling, right? Because you're the grassroots, you're the ones doing the hard work. So how do we make sure your voices are there? We can't just assume that your voices are there, even though there's lots of representation from each of your countries. So that's one space. How many of you know about the conference happening next year called Women Deliver? Yeah, so Women Deliver is held every three years or so. And it's a huge conference, again, thousands of women and men, but thousands mostly of women, coming together to talk about the women's rights agendas. Next year it's happening in Vancouver in June 2019, and Cody intends to have a big presence. So I will be in touch with you and, and colleagues as well as we're putting that planning together about what that looks like and how we can make some noise together. How many of you have applied to try to go to that? Yeah, a few of you. So take a look at the Women Deliver website, but I'll also um, share more information with you. It would be impossible for us to bring everybody to Women Deliver. I would love to have that kind of money. Ooh, wouldn't that be, be great? Amazing. We, could do our, we could do our own Women Deliver yeah. right here. <laughs> and maybe that's one of the things you want to suggest. But, but there, what is it we need to know? What is it we need to do? What's our purpose? It's not just to gather. What do we want to do with that? The topic is power. Mm. We just spent seven weeks analyzing it to death. So I'm sure we have something we can say. So what is it that we could do there? All right. Every couple of years, I think every three to four years, the AWID, we talk so much about AWID because we respect AWID. AWID has a conference, a forum, again, a global one, every three to four years. What is it we could do there? Those are all spaces where we have like-minded people to talk to, right? So I'm, and I think those are good for us to nurture us, to help us move the movements forward. But where are also some unlikely spaces where you think we could be also um, involved? So let me stop and let me suggest that if you'd like to share an idea that we do that, perhaps what you can do is just come up one by one here and talk to the to the microphone since we've got our technological challenges. Does that sound okay? So anybody want to sort of start the ball? Anybody got an idea that they want to start off with? Who's ready? Come on. Oh yes. And say your name and your country so that everybody uh, who's listening to this will be able to, to know where you're coming from. Um, I'm Domina from Madagascar. And uh, I would be interested in having this network at regional level, maybe, because uh, when I will have an issue, then in in my country, I would like to have um, advice um, advices from experts 
because I might not um, have all the expertise, like in law, for example, or in uh, international affairs or things like that. So I would like to bring the issue within the network and to mobilize then all the expertise with me at regional level, but yes, at international level as well with the Cody alumni. Thank you. Somebody else? What can we do together? This is Farhad from Pakistan. I have an idea that uh, since we all, and af apart from uh, building our movement from the regional level, because the area where I am coming from is marred with a lot of conflicts and uh, between the countries. So uh, within those, those that region, there should be a regional movement among us, the uh, CODI graduates from the region so that we can build the momentum to have more cooperation among countries to influence them. And secondly, uh, the more important factor that can enhance this idea will be to have a joint uh, conferences on a, on a regional level to, to submit to much higher level and suggest changes in, uh, in the text or in the policies at large. And one more, which is, which is very close to my heart, is most of the time, m many of the organizations sitting around the table today here also, and back home, they always uh, think about uh, dependence on the funding. Mm -hmm. Why not uh, we all CODI graduates develop a fund for ourselves where we can pull in and help those organizations within us to, uh, to elevate for example, a collective movement within us. Mm -hmm. that can be. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I just want to clarify that what, at first what I heard you say, Farhat, was that you would like a regional network and the network then would contribute to the movement building, right? Or the, the sustaining of the movement, right? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I am Adam Ba from Cameroon. I'm actually proposing that we could have um, every after four years, um, all the Kodi alumni could be able to come. Maybe we choose an area of the world where we could meet and have a common issue, maybe an idea, uh, an idea which is pressing in all the countries. Maybe a, a theme of the year which we want to work on. Is it fighting for peace? Is it talking about harassment? Just a theme of the year, every four years, four years, we have our luminaries come together and talk about it and amplify that change. It could, maybe before the four years, we could do it at the regional level. And at the, the point when we are about to come here, we could choose an area. It could be in Malaysia, it could be in Africa, it could be in Europe, anywhere. We all come together with ideas and then we talk about it. So Ada, do you think that it would be important to create a new mechanism that would meet every three or four years? Yes, or it's is very it, important. You, you think it needs to be something very specific to Cody and not just joining another network or another sort of network event? To me, it, it should be very special to Cody because <laughs> Cody already has more than 1,000 aluminals. And mm -hmm. if we build our networks very strong, we'll be making a strong movement that will stand on Cody. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mulu? And you can come up in line maybe here. So that uh, my name is Molo. I'm from Ethiopia and I'm working in university. Um, my idea is uh, issue of women in academics. Uh, academic environment is highly patriarchic and I also believe highly neglected area in terms of addressing gender issue in that context. So I want to create network with women in academics, mm -hmm. regionally, internationally. I've already started in my university by establishing Women in Academic Association. I want to expand this association, mainly to increase uh, women in academic leadership position, as well as to improve female student achievement, because enrollment is becoming okay, but the problem is that we have a lot of problems with current achievement and a lot of dropouts, all those problems. So 
I want to create a network of women in academics regionally and also internationally. Mm -hmm, great. And so that contributes by also to, I think, of a broader sort of set of issues around women in higher education. Yes. But also the, again, as we've been talking about over the, over the course of many weeks, is about you know, the, the environment in which university academics, university women are working. Yeah. And how can that really shift? Yes. Um, and again, address uh, patriarchal structures that are really prohibitive. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, hello, my name is Nargiza. I'm from Turkey. And uh, coming out from the idea that Mulu just had, uh, I think uh, it would be, maybe it would be nice to have topical groups for each cluster. Like uh, some of us work in education and some of our, uh, us works with disabled people and uh, some of us works for training of the women. Maybe we can uh, have uh, different topics we, uh, somewhere in the internet or uh, some portal where we can discuss our joint uh, problems and exchange ideas. And this way, we, maybe we can um, maybe start some of the projects together in different clusters. Thank you. Great, thank you. Also, that's something that Wendy and I are both um, really interested in seeing happen. And, uh, and also Naima and Naima, and I would expect that Robin and other colleagues have also their particular expertise areas that can really benefit those kinds of groups. So whether it's the climate change area that you've heard Naima speaking about or health issues and health systems that she's also done or peace and conflict that Robin is focusing in on and so many other places as well, right? So this is Rebecca from Nigeria. Before co coming to Cody, I had different perspective about gender. And uh, on coming to Cody, I realized that most of the people calling themselves gender experts in my organization, as well as in neighboring organizations, don't know what gender is. And that is why we are not moving forward. And so I'm looking forward to a, a point where Cody will partner with Nigeria and Africa at large and be able to come for conferences or floats programs in Africa because a lot of people might not be able to come here or get sponsored to come here so that we can educate people more on what gender really is mm -hmm. and not what they think it is. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Rebecca. That's a really important point. And some of the work that we've seen that we've been doing through um, Cody's Empower Project program, um, which has been working with um, partners in Ghana and Ethiopia and also in um, Tanz uh, Zambia, sorry, um, has really tried to focus in on that as well as looking at women's empowerment in, uh, in the economic sphere and in food security. And I just want to point out that Elham Mumuni has just joined <laughs> us from Ghana. Elham is a graduate and she's also part of the Empower program and she's co-facilitating with me the program that starts next week. So welcome, oh, Elham. Thank you. I know you're very jet lagged. <laughs> so great to have you here, Elham. We'll talk in a moment. But but the point here that I'm hearing from you, Rebecca, is one that I share is a lot of times people that are in the roles of gender advisor or gender expert in their organizations haven't had formal training and don't necessarily have the tools. Mm. So it's not that they don't have the intent, but they don't necessarily have the capacity. Okay. Hello. I'm Khulud from Palestine. Um, one of my concerns is that normally we speak in platforms where women are already our allies and we speak to people who have the same kind of thoughts, the same or similar agenda. And what I want to do is to um, speak to an audience that can, is not necessarily our ally. And I think media is an important platform for that. So from here, from uh, GCL 18, I propose to a few people here, and I'm expanding this to the others, that I want to come to your countries, and I want to train women that you work with to be trainers in media, wow. so that we can amplify women's voices from women to women, from grassroots to grassroots, and so that the women in your countries can have the skills and also hopefully the te technical ability to be able to spread the stories. And maybe these stories can 
uh, we can show them globally, but also we can create a platform online where we have stories from women from all around the world to, for people to see. Yes. Sounds like a fantastic yes. idea. <laughs> Bring it on. Kalu's got a big dream. And GCL TV, yes, that sounds great to you. And just, Kalu, I just wanted to build on that to say there are other women in our network that are also equally enthused about that, you know, the ICT, social media, mm -hmm. media dimension. And I think um, we have a lot of work to do at Cody to make sure that all of you are connected the best we can do, right? It's, it's, that's part of what Wendy's role is, but it, and also our, our respective team roles. Um, and some of it just has to be organic. You just say out on the network, hello, I'm working on this area and just taking the initiative. But there are some others that I know, and also here in Canada, that would love to connect to you. So that's great. Thank you. I am Mahbuba from Tajikistan. I work in OEC, and uh, I work with a network of uh, 18 uh, civil society organizations. I think by itself it's already um, a great power. And in my opinion, it would be great to bring together civil society organizations throughout the world together because they are the ones who are working in grassroots level and it's, it would be great to bring them together and uh, create platforms for them. And also in the meantime, um, a lot of different conferences are taking part in different countries of the world and they are very great platforms to bring those civil societies to those platforms so that they can speak what's going on and bring it back to the uh, societies where they live. Where they live. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Those, are, those are also great. You know, and Mabuba, as you were talking, I was thinking also about with not forgetting that we're already connected, of course, to many different networks, yeah. right? So what is it that we, you know, where do we see a value in connecting some of us to those networks, to your networks, or letting your networks know also about the great work that each of each of you are doing, so that they, so basically the sharing of the knowledge that you've gained about who's doing what and where, and making new new form new connections and new forms. For me, the challenge with the big groups at, at, at conferences is always thinking about, okay, what's the value add here? What is it that we're really getting out of this? because it's a carbon footprint when we're traveling and you know it's a, it's it's costly so what is it we really want to achieve sometimes it's just about exposure especially if you've never had it other times it's about really trying to set an agenda and move forward and that's what the strength of movements are is that they're they're really focused in on a big purpose you know an ambitious sort of shift um, and you know that's what I'm hoping. Also, we can think a little bit about is is there a collective um, statement that we can be making as well, you know, um, on behalf of this alumni group, Marjorie? Yes, I'm Marjorie from Malawi. Uh, the idea that I have is to start locally, get in touch with the alumni, the GCL alumni that have participated in this program, and then together sit down and brainstorm. On, on how we can strengthen the movements that are already there or establish movements if they are, if they are none currently. Because uh, in my country, women are aware of the challenges that they face, but they lack leadership. So from the skills that we have gained here, I believe we can do something together. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. So starting by thinking and acting local, right, Marjorie? Yes. Mm -hmm. Within the sphere of influence that you have. Ifat. Yes, I'm Ifit from Pakistan. Um, I'm looking at this platform as a, f as a ground for all the women who are part of this GCL course, where we'll be exploring each other's expertise, each other area where we can support each other, just like Kaluth said, and just like um, Eileen mentioned that it may not be possible for us to travel a lot, but I think with the support of this technology, online things, we can support each other. We can build capacities of each other. So I would be looking at this as a network, as a platform, where we are just sharing that what's going on, how we can support each other, how we can add value in what is going on, and how we can get uh, expertise, advice on this, that how we can move forward. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm, for me, it's a big, big, small global village mm -hmm. where we are just sharing with each other and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. Certainly technology has really created that, that possibility now more than ever. Sometimes almost too much at times. <laughs> when it works. <laughs> because you're constantly in another time zone. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I don't sleep very well anymore because I'm actually in somebody else's time zone half the time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for those great suggestions. I think the one thing I will ask you to think about is how do you keep up the momentum? Right? So you've been here and you're right now enthusiastic. And then you get back home into your daily lives. So thinking about the momentum that we want to build and you know, also knowing that sometimes you'll come into the space and sometimes you'll step away. That's that's natural. But thinking, you know, if we're serious about this movement building or serious about just network building, then, you know, we need to think about what we want to do to sustain the actions as well. I think I'm going to sign off here. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening today um, online to the webinar and um, apologies for some of the technological difficulties we had on the Cody end. But I especially would like to thank the class of 2018. <laughs> Wonderful, smart, articulate, powerful women from around the world. And uh, it's been an honor. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with them. It is an honor and pleasure to work with Naima Chowdhury, who led this group for seven weeks. <laughs> Seven weeks is a long time to facilitate, <laughs> and not, not even just facilitate, but also coordinate and make sure that your needs are attended to. Um, and so my wish for you as you're going home is that you have somebody in your life as supportive as Naima has been for you these seven weeks. I think uh, we, could all, um, we could all have more Naimas in our lives. I know that yeah. much, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also wouldn't be possible to do the GCL program or any of our programs without some amazing young women leaders. <laughs> and we've been really lucky to have two um, summer interns of two pretty awesome Santa Vax University students going into their final senior year um, focused on women and gender studies. That's Salome Barker and Christina Ture. <laughs> And they are, you know, probably thinking, okay, phew, it's done. But they're not realizing, of course, that, well, they do realize that next week we'll be doing another Women's Leadership. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have the honor and, uh, and the pleasure of having, I think, around 30 um, participants joining us next week. So another, another amazing group of women. And I can't wait to tell them all about you. So thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody online, and I look forward to getting all your feedback from this session. Thank you. Thank you.